EBPF is a revolutionary technology with origins in Linux kernel that can run sandbox programs in an operating system kernel. It is used to safely and efficiently extend the capabilities of the kernel without requiring to change kernel source code or load kernel modules. <laughs> oh my, that was the official definition of EBPF. Nevertheless, I am not here to recite the official definitions of anything. I'm here to give you a practical introduction to eBPF and how it can be used to solve real world problems. I want to explain what it is, how it works and why it is a game changer. And trust me, it is a game changer. There is no better place to implement observability, security, and networking than in the Linux kernel. It's as easy as that. There is no better place. And the reason is very, very, very simple. Everything goes through kernel, one way or another. So let me explain it through a diagram. Let me draw how it all works. We're going to take a very quick detour from the main subject because I have to tell you about the sponsor of this video, which is Datri. It is a security tool that prevents misconfigurations in Kubernetes by enforcing a policy or a set of policies on your cluster. It comes with multiple built-in practices, such as NSA, hardening guides, secret scanning, and EKS security best practices. And it offers native monitoring and CLI integration. Please go to datri.io to start your free trial, to check out the tool. And at the same time, by checking them out, you will be supporting this channel. Thank you so much. Now let's go to the main subject. So we have some process that could be your application or any other process. And that process needs to communicate with other processes through networking. And between that process and the network, we have Linux kernel, that's your operating system. And how do we do that? Well, the process, let's say your application sends a syscall, and that syscall goes to a socket or sockets, to TCP IP, to network device, and so on and so forth. And all that is happening within the Linux kernel. And those are the places that we want to observe, that we might want to modify one way or another, and that we want to secure. The stuff happening within Linux kernel is the stuff that we want to observe, to look at, to see what's going on, to modify somehow and to secure, because that's where the things are really, really, really happening. Yet for a while now, we've been doing much of operations outside kernel, or to be more precise, both outside and inside the kernel. Since Eventually, everything needs to pass through the kernel one way or another. It's unavoidable. If, for example, you're using Kubernetes, you're probably adding sidecar containers or more likely other tools are doing that for you. A good example would be a service mesh. If you want advanced networking capabilities, we will likely use a service mesh like Istio or LinkedIn. So we end up having a pod that initially has one container, that's your application typically, and we have some other pods with some other applications. And when we want those applications to talk with each other, the containers or applications in containers inside of that pod, if we are talking about Kubernetes, we need some kind of a proxy that will handle that communication, unless the communication is very, very simple, in which case we don't need all that. And that's why we put sidecar containers. So we attach additional functionality like having a proxy uh, to the application running in a container as an additional container in the same pod. So we have, apart from the application itself, additional container in this case with proxy capabilities. So the application does not communicate with other applications directly, but through the sidecar container, through the proxy, and that proxy sends to the proxy of the other application, and then the proxy of that other application sends it to the application itself. Now you might be asking, why do we do that? Well, because networking has certain requirements. We might want to add MTLS or mutual TLS, 
to those applications so that they communicate with each other securely. We might need to have additional routing. We might need some security stuff going on there or observability. We might want to see what's going on and so on and so forth. So those additional containers, sidecar containers, give us that additional uh, capability, those additional features, like what I said, MTLS, routing, security, observabilities, and so on and so forth. Now, the problem is that it doesn't stop there. Uh, apart from networking, we might need additional sidecar containers for other types of functionalities or features. And very often, we end up with having a pod with one main container, that's our application, and then any number of sidecar containers that give additional, all the capabilities we need that application to have. Now, what I just showed with sidecar containers is opposite from what I said before. Because before I said, hey, the best place to implement those things, those additional capabilities or constraints is in the kernel. And that might lead you to ask, hey, why do we add sidecar containers if it's better to do it in the kernel, from a kernel? After all, everything goes through the kernel. That's what I said, didn't I? At least one way or another, everything goes through a kernel. There is a twofold answer to that question. First of all, kernel is a better place to implement networking, observability, security, and so on and so forth, because it is the kernel that has privileged ability to oversee and control the entire system. Kernel is the operating system, and that's what operating systems do. They oversee and control the entire system. One way or another, everything, and I repeat, everything goes through the kernel. Now, let me go back to the question, why do we use sidecars for something that is better done in the kernel? Well, the answer lies in innovation and security. If we would allow anyone or anything to modify the kernel, we would expose ourselves to a lot of security issues. Because remember, kernel is privileged. It can do anything. And the only way to extend the kernel is by giving privileged access to whomever is extending it. That someone or something could be a malicious actor. So there is no safe way to extend the kernel. On top of that, kernels evolve slowly. And when I say slowly, I mean very, very, very slowly. It takes a long time to get a new feature into the kernel. And given the fast pace of innovation, that is not fast enough. Security, observability, and networking are all areas that are evolving much, much, much faster than the kernel itself. And that's a good thing. We want kernels to be stable and secure, but we also want to tap into the innovation that is happening in those areas. And that's why we have sidecars. They attach to our applications, you know, running as containers, and perform needed functions like networking, observability, and security. However, sidecars have their own set of problems. They can easily get into each other way. Because when you have a bunch of sidecars attached to one application, to one process, to one container, then they start competing with each other. What one sidecar is doing might affect another sidecar. Also, Upgrading sidecars can result in the need to restart the application, the container with the application that sidecar is attached to or the other way around. There are a bunch of other issues with sidecars. Sidecars are, in a way, equivalent to distributed monoliths. It seems like they're independent from the processes they attach to, but in practice, they're closely tied to them, to those operations. And the operations we do to one might and often do affect the other. And when I say affect, I mean break. Now, even if side effects of sidecars are not important to you, there is still a problem of resource usage. Sidecars do not run on thin air. They consume memory and they consume CPU. Now you might say that a sidecar does not consume much, and that's absolutely true. Still, if you have many processes running in a cluster, you need to multiply the memory and CPU used by one, a sidecar, with the number of processes that are running in a cluster. After all, each container in a pod might need a number of sidecars attached to it. 
And then comes the question, do we really, really, really want to consume additional memory and CPU for every single replica of every single application we run in a cluster? Well, the answer is no, if we can help it. So sidecars provide extensibility we need, but they come at a cost in terms of resource usage, complexity, stability, and so on and so forth. Now imagine that we can have both. Imagine that we could extend the kernel in a safe way and augment it with the innovation that is happening in the areas like security, networking, and observability. Would we still need sidecars? Well, no, no, we wouldn't. Sidecars are a necessary evil meant to be a temporary solution until we get something better. Now we do have something better, and that something better is called eBPF. eBPF allows us to run sandboxed programs inside the kernel, inside the operating system, and that alone is a game changer. With eBPF, we can, for example, see and understand all, and I repeat, all system calls. By doing that, we can, at least in theory, provide more secure systems than with anything else. So let me go back to the initial diagram, the first one I showed. We have a process, that process makes a system call, at least when networking is concerned. That system call goes through the Linux kernel, through sockets and TCP IP and network device, and ends up in the network, and then it goes all the way back. Now, if we need to extend almost any part of that process, or if we need to observe anything within that schema, or secure, then we can use eBPF to attach in a way or observe or modify any of those steps in the process. We can attach an eBPF process to the main process itself, to the application. We can attach it to system calls, to sockets, to TCP IP, to network device, to the network itself. We can attach eBPF almost anywhere. Now, it doesn't make sense to attach it almost anywhere because we already have solutions for some of those things like, hey, processes and network, those things that are outside or on top of or below in Linux kernel. We already know how to do that. But what's happening inside Linux kernel, the syscall and sockets and TCP IP and network devices and many, 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 many other things, that's where we can leverage eBPF and say, hey, go into extend the Linux kernel and do something with sockets or TCP IP or monitor it or observe it or secure it, do whatever we need to be done. So we can use EPF to implement networking, observability, tracing, and a myriad of other things as sandbox, and this is important, sandboxed programs operating inside the kernel. As such, we can get significantly, significantly faster networking that would not be burdened by the overhead of sidecars. We can collect any metrics available in the kernel, which is significantly more than those available to outside processes. We can trace anything, we can observe anything, so on and so forth. We get, at least in theory, more for less. We get more observability, security, and networking with higher performance and lower overhead, at least in theory. And now comes the question, what's not to like about that? It's better and cheaper at the same time. And that's what makes EBPF potentially, and I say potentially because it's still a relatively young technology. Anyways, that's what makes EBPF awesome. And one more thing, I almost forgot to mention what EBPF means. EBPF comes from BPF, that stands for Berkeley Packet Filter. EBPF is the evolution of BPF and stands for Extended Berkeley Packet Filter. And that part, does not really matter because everybody calls it eBPF. Nobody knows that it's Berkeley packet filter or nobody cares about it. So we can continue calling it eBPF. And now the important question is how you can benefit from eBPF. You can, of course, learn how to write eBPF programs, but for, let's face it, for the majority of us, that might be more than we need. The good news is that many applications are built to leverage the power of eBPF. That could be Cilium for networking, Falco for security, ground cover for observability, and so on and so forth. The number of tools built on top of eBPF is growing rapidly. 
really, really fast. And even those that were built to run as sidecars are being rewritten to leverage eBPF. So I'm certain, and I'm readily certain, but this time I'm certain that eBPF is the next big thing when observability, networking, and security are concerned. There are certainly many other use cases for eBPF, but those that I mentioned, observability, networking, security, are already there, are already with us, with much more to come. So the next time you're looking for a tool focused on one of those areas, networking, observability, and security, make sure to check whether it is based on eBPF. I'm not saying that should be your only criteria, but it is certainly an important one. And before we close, the only question left to ask is, would you like me to explore some of those tools, some of those eBPF tools? If you think that's a good idea, if that's something that sounds interesting, let me know in the comments. See you next time. Cheers.